I'm a CPW. My name is Sarah Danziger. Thank you for coming out tonight to our best night of the week. Meet the artist here at CPW. Um, if you like what you see, become a member. We've got amazing programming. We have free artist talks. We have a digital media lab. We have a big summer of workshops planned, um, which I'm very excited to announce coming up very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but also it's just a fun community to be a part of if you are an artist or if you're just an art enthusiast. So please consider that. Um, you're in our current show right now, which is curated by our in-house curator, Adam Giles Ryan uh, of Adriana Alt's work. Um, Adriana lives in Rhinebeck and this is a really stunning show. So if you haven't gotten a chance to see it, please take a look afterwards. Um, it's made between her uh, home state of Louisiana, New Orleans specifically, and Rhinebeck. So please take a look. Um, tonight, we are joined by uh, Nestor Perez Moliere. Um, thank you, Leslie, for putting us in touch. Um, Nestor was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and currently resides in the Bronx, New York. His art entails a process of self-discovery, a series of confessionals revealing private conflicts, hoping towards catharsis. Through this cathartic process, he hopes to connect with the viewer's struggles and depathologize negative feelings so that they can be seen as a source for political action rather than its antithesis. Nestor exposes mental health issues like depression, dysmorphia, food addictions, and loneliness describing their mechanisms, scrutinizing their origins, and illuminating the impossibility of fixing them. His practice mainly takes place in the realm of photography, but has also incorporated performance, drawing, video, installation, and intaglio techniques into his works. He received a B an MFA from Hunter College and holds a Bachelor of Science in Botany. He was part of the Emerge New York City 2023 Artists in Marketplace 2017 and create, Creative Capital's Taller 2019 Mentorship Programs and was included in the Bronx Museum of the Arts Fourth Biennale. Biennale. Biennial. <laughs> Biennale. Biennale. Um, he has exhibited at the Museo de las Americas, the Clemente Soto Velez Bronx Art Space Longwood Gallery, and the Liga de Estudiantes de Art de San Juan, Puerto Rico. In 2023, he will be a resident at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Governor's Island Art Center and Sultan Stahl Foundation for the Arts Residencies. Interested in uh, becoming an educator, he teaches and has taught digital and darkroom photography as well as media literacy at the International Center of Photography, Parsons School of Design, Art Academy of Cincinnati, Fairleigh Dickinson University, The Point CDC, and Strudel Media Live. All right, got through it. Thank you. Can we give a warm welcome to Nestor, please? Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. I love the, the intimate space that we have here. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for my bio. It's a mouthful, right? Uh, but hopefully, after viewing my work, you'll understand a little bit better what I mean with all of those, uh, those things that I have written for my bio. Uh, I want to first thank CPW for hosting me. Uh, Sarah and Nicole for organizing all of this it has been amazing to come up here and spend the evening with all of you. Also, Leslie Dessler Shikanosi, who made the connection with Sarah so that we could be up here, and also my partner for taking the time to come with me up here and drive me because I don't own a car. <laughs> so, thank you everybody for being here. I want to start us off with a video performance.
Thank you. Um, so I do performance. Uh, my I do a lot of photography. Uh, it has never been a very linear trajectory, uh, but I started doing self-portraits for like, I've been doing them for 10 years. So eventually I ended up developing my practice into the world of performance. So you'll see um, a lot of my work uh, also um, well, we're going to look at a piece at the end also, but, uh, yes, my trajectory in photography has not been linear. I was a botanist before I became a photographer. I was a digital archivist at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx, photographing scientific specimens. And at one point I started dissecting myself scientifically by looking at every, I was so focused on all of these plant parts and all of these details that then eventually I turned the camera onto myself and started photographing myself. Uh, I'm not gonna take you through my work chronologically, uh, but I wanted to, to mention that um, about 10 years ago, there was a shift in how I was thinking about my photography. And I decided to go back to school and pursue a master's in fine arts. I was able to survive the pandemic by developing a whole thesis um, and I'm going to start with that body of work. It's called The Losses, The Heartbreaks, The Hungers. And in this body of work, um, it was, it's not about the pandemic, but the pandemic was such a great way to explore some of some ideas that I've been wanting to for a very long time. I have always been interested in home, the idea of home as a place where we can explore our emotions fully because there's no filtering when, when we're outside, we tend to filter ourselves, right? And 
and maybe portray ourselves in a happier version, uh, maybe some sadness, but not to the full extent, but at home, we're able to, to do that. So I was always very interested in, and I live in a small studio in the Bronx. So the, the whole idea of being uh, trapped in the space was such a great way to explore, explore all of this. So I started looking a lot of at the space, at the light and the shadows and started um, taking self portraits in the space and a lot of, a lot of photography surrounding mirrors uh, because obviously it was about myself. I wanted to talk about depression and mental health. Um, and so that space allowed me to explore all of this. And I was also very interested in having a conversation with myself, right? I was reading a lot about self-compassion and I kept asking myself, would I, how would I take care of myself? Um, would I be, wanna be living with somebody like myself? Would I, how would I love myself? How would I take care of myself through all of those uh, emotions that happen in, in the space? And I remember taking this photo. These are, all of these images are uh, done in film. They're all medium format. Um, I remember taking this photo of this plant that was dying on me and kept thinking, it's like, how can I take care of myself if I'm not taking care of this plant? So it became sort of like a symbol of that idea of self-care and self-compassion. Um, and um, I photographed myself in so many different moods. Uh, again, light and shadow played a big role, right? Between positive emotions and negative emotions. A lot of thinking about negative self-talk too. Um, and here I'm blinded by the light, but somehow I'm like shying away from the light as in I'm not ready to receive positive thoughts at the moment. Um, so it's really about um, living all of those emotions to their full extent. And I started, I also wanted, I obviously because I wanted to have a conversation with myself, I started uh, duplicating myself in the frame um, and performing <clears throat> all of these interactions that I could potentially have with myself uh, and here, this is one of the first images I took where I was uh, multiplying myself and there's like this hovering figure that's trying to appease this um, figure <clears throat> in stress. Um, and I kept playing with the idea um, of that duplicity and kept kept thinking about, do I wanna, would I be in a relationship with myself? Would I? take care of myself? What are, what, what are the things that I like about myself? The ne negative self-talk kept happening. Um, and so I started playing with this idea of the power dynamics, right? Between uh, an elated person, right? Somebody that is not depressed, that's happy, that's emotionally stable, right? Elated versus a person that is depressed. Um, and so in this photo, it's about to slap one of the other and and so much about the shame. Um, and then um, the project also has hope in it, right? Um, this is the same plant that was dying earlier, but now I was able to take care of it and revive it and, and it has new growth. Uh, so the, the project has hope in it, right? It's not just about negative emotions and, and, self, and negative self-talk. There's also some hope. Um, I work a lot with the body. We'll talk about that later. Um, the idea of space, light and shadow again. Um, and then I have been reading this uh, uh, writer for some years now. Her name is Anne Kvektovich. I might be butchering her last name. Um, but I really love her depression, her proposal. She proposes that depression can be an opportunity for re-examination and, and change. Um, so I wanted to not wallow in the negative self -emo negative emotions and really push this work into a work into a, uh, a place where something positive can come out of it. So I kept playing with this whole idea of 
would I be with myself? Would I talk with myself? Would I entertain dating somebody like, like myself and kept on playing with all of these moments of care and intimacy with myself um, and taking care of myself and all of that. But eventually what happened was that I also started noticing how I was both myself and somebody else. So not, not, I was embodying somebody that was not necessarily me. So then I started playing with the idea of um, queer relationships, right? Um, and power dynamics between these relationships. As, as we know, um, there's all relationships, especially heterosexual ones, have the, uh, the idea of one dominant role and one passive role. And a lot of that get, gets mapped into queer relationships. So I wanted to break a little bit with that. And for example, this photo, there's, there's a hovering figure that's pushing down the one that's below. Um, so there's some sort of control that's happening, but the dominant figure is being gagged by the remote control. So that's a, a place of submission, right? Uh, but then if you can see the lower figure also has a remote control in the hand. So it's almost like breaking away with that binary of power, powerful and passiveness, right? It's like both figures are in the control of what's happening. Um, so that's how I was able to go deeper into this project about mental health. And BDSM plays a big role in the work. Um, the work you'll see a lot of the remote control. Uh, and here we have the two figures also um, with the remote control in hand, which means that they're both in control. So it's really working, breaking down that power dynamic. Um, as I said, there's some BDSM, sorry for the scandalous photo. Um, there's a lot of BDSM that's so, so much about shame. And I was interested in the idea of um, how we sometimes our negative self-talk is about shaming ourselves. So um, I was interested in, in including that into the project. Um, but as you go through the entire project, you end up in a place. This is usually my end in photo for the series. It's sort of like uh, an alone figure uh, securing itself, looking straight at the camera, revealing everything. Um, as in sort of like, we are all part of this, like we're, we're both positive and negative inside, um, but this is who we are. So um, it's sort of like affronting those different types of emotions. Um, so that is the losses, the heartbreaks, the hungers. And now I wanna talk about two bodies of work that I'm currently developing at the same time. One is called the caresses of your bullying and the other one's called the fingers won't let go. And I'm gonna read uh, some, an excerpt. <clears throat> the hand comes flying, fingers at the ready, they approach. They get closer to the chest, they touch. Immediately a fiery sensation is felt on your tit. You pull away, but that only makes the fingers grab onto the nipple. They grab. The fire turns into an electrical jolt that goes deep into the flesh. Hissing comes out through the teeth. A lump forms in your throat. They pinch. The only thing you hear are the laughs from everyone around. You still pull away, but the fingers won't let go. They twist. You run out of air as you scream. They finally stop. You walk away. After so many times, the body just hunches over to hide the tits you perpetually look at the floor. Rafael didn't let me go on a school field trip because he was a bully and I was fat. That day, I wore a neon, neon yellow t-shirt. I was excited about it. I hadn't worn it before. Rafael looked at me and told me I looked as huge as the sun. He then shot me on the chest with a water rifle. I died at that moment. I returned to the car where my mother was and I started crying. I tried to explain to her what happened, but the sobs wouldn't let me, that I was always teased and bullied by all the boys. 
I didn't want to go on the field trip anymore. I asked my mother not to make me go. Rafael didn't let me go on the field trip because he was an alpha male and I was fat. I deserved it. I never wore that t-shirt again. You looked at me across from across the bar. You winked at me and motioned to come over. I walked around the crowded Chelsea bar towards you. You looked at me up and down. I said, hi, you said, hi. We started chatting, even though the music was banging loudly. Your name was John. You asked me about my day. I said that I was tired from work and exercise. You played, you placed your hand on my chest and pushed me away. You looked up and down and you looked up and down at my body. You said, you don't look like you go to the gym. I walked away eating your words. How thin do you have to be to be loved? What if all the time I spent wanting to die was just about wanting to be outside of a body that has endured what this one has? How does one live in a body when they have spent a lifetime trying to escape it? So this is um, a very short version of a 25 minute performance. So the audio you heard is from The Fingers Won't Let Go, um, which I developed during residencies last year at Emerge with Emerge NYC and LMCC's Art Center at Governor's Island. And The Fingers Won't Let Go is a painfully honest memoir uh, in which I combine video, audio, and performance uh, in this multi-dimensional piece. And it's really so much about living a life uh, as a survivor of bullying and how bullying still plays a role as an adult and you still see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so it's really much about that. And uh, the work is it's an archive of feelings, right? It's, it's a br brutal memoir, brutally, uh, brutally honest memoir that really goes into a lot of different moments in life, um, surviving all of this. It's also a coming out story in how mental um, bullying affected mental health and how mental health affected the coming out process. Um, and then the other, the images that you saw, it's another project called The Caresses of Your Bullying, which are chemigram, it's a mural of chemigrams and, and lumen prints um, in which I'm using oils, butters, lards into, onto the photographic emulsion that then are then developed in all the chemistry, but because something's blocking the emulsion, it doesn't develop as it should. So then I end up with all of these different textures and moments that are happening. So um, uh, the, the use of, I'm calling them fat phobic uh, materials, right? Because as society, we're so afraid of fat and lard and oils and butter. Um, so it really has to do a lot, a lot about that bullying as, as being fat, right? Like people are so scared about fat people and, and not wanting to become fat. Uh, but then the, these resists are very strong. So um, the way in which the markings happen on the paper, so I'm literally filling my hand with uh, Crisco or, or lard and slapping my hands into the photographic emulsion or punching it. So the photos become an index of the Boolean. Um, but then because the material, the resists don't leave that easy, not everything gets developed. And so the middle parts of like the hand, for example, are lumen prints, which continue to change as times goes by. Um, and it's a, I'm still working on this project, but this is the first iteration as I did uh, last year, it's a mural, but I wanna continue working with, with the idea and expanding it further. Um, so that brings me to, I do a lot of work with, that deals with body dysmorphia. And one of my first projects was called Wearing Bodies. And I was very interested in looking at male representations in social media and how so many Right now, the rep that representation is about perfect, idealistic, rip bodies. 
And not just on social media, a lot of gay dating apps, this is what you see. And so for me, it was so much about living a fantasy and thinking about how would it be if I would have a body like that? So I started clipping, cutting off body parts from social media and putting them onto myself as if there were articles of clothing. And this is before AI, I must say, because now everybody can get a, a beautiful body with AI. This was all before AI. It's from 2016, so it's one of my earlier works. Uh, but it, it was very interesting to embody what that other male, what the, the way that that other male was representing themselves. So it was matching the lighting, matching the film sense, uh, matching the pose. So it was very performative um, as I was working on these. And it was, so, it was, it's sad, but at the same time, it's kind of fun as a photographer to technically be able to, to create all of these. I created so many, um, they're on my website if you're curious. Um, uh, I was uh, at the fourth biennial at the Bronx Museum of Art and I decided to play with the same idea, but then now then I was using real models that were posing for me and it was a very performative process to create this piece. This is just two details of a te tetraptic, if you wanna call them that way. There's four four photos to the whole piece, um, but it's it's that whole idea of me struggling with that idea. Um, I also do pre making. I love intaglio. If you don't know what intaglio is, it's grabbing a copper plate and using acids to create an image on the copper plate. Then I ink the plate, run it through a, through a press, and then I get a print. And so this is touch grab pinch twist. Um, it's also performative. I put myself in front of a camera, was really thinking about bodily trauma, um, the poses, the, the flesh, the skin folds, the striations. Um, and so then transferred that silhouette into the metal plate and then started playing with scratches and all of that to talk about that idea of bodily trauma. Um, it's a portfolio of 12, I'm only showing six, um, but I also have a little bit of a text that I'm gonna read. This body serves as a target practice for you to direct your outrage. This body draws, draws so much anger from those I have been trained to desire. This body has learned its lesson. This body was taken from me so long ago though it was never mine to begin with. How thin do you have to be to be loved? How does one live in a body when they have spent a lifetime trying to escape it? It must be nice to just be a body. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I also love talking about eating disorders. Uh, and because why not, if I'm already talking about depression and about myself, why not completely uh, talk about all my issues through art? Um, I One of my first projects was to talk about emotional eating, and I created a cookbook that was uh, highlighting trigger foods. Trigger foods are the foods that you go for when you're about to do a binge. Uh, pizza, nachos, fried chicken, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I'm also very interested in still life and food photography. I'm a frustrated chef, uh, so I love cooking. So I really wanted to play with the idea of the traditional cookbook with the traditional, uh, the idea of a food memoir, which is also very common, but the idea of also of an emotional food journal, which is if you have issues with emotional eating or anorexia or bulimia, you write down everything that you consume and all the emotions associated during that moment of consumption. So when you start reading the text, uh, it's talking about hopelessness, it's talking about depression, it's talking about not wanting to do anything with your life. So it's a very sarcastic approach to the whole idea. So when you're feeling emotional, who the hell is gonna bake a pizza, right? So the instructions tell you to go to the neighborhood pizza joints to buy the pizza. Uh, but it goes through a lot of different uh, moments, a lot of the body. Um, 
and also negative self-talk um, and the way that you convince yourself into this binge. And you have to think about binges as a process in which you're feeling high and a low at the same time, right? Your serotonin is going high from the consumption of food. You're getting that sweetness. You're getting that fatness that's so delicious. But at the same time, there's a lot of shame associated with it. Um, and I hope everybody has ever tried a tres leches in your life. It's a Latino cake. It's delicious. It's better than sex. Uh, but it's one of the food foods uh, in the book. Uh, but I've used it for a couple of projects. I also did a, another chemigram project in which I was very interested in tracking my binges um, with tres leches, which is one of my trigger foods. So I would, the moment I would feel like that with that negative emotion, I would put the cake on top of the, the photographic paper, eat off of it, and then develop the resulting smear. And so you can see it here being developed with the resulting mm, tres leches cake is a very milky cake. So there's a lot of residue when you're done. So that allowed me to be able to use it as a resist and, and hold back the developing and create these beautiful um, abstract figures that are happening. And then because I'm also thinking about the emotional food journal, each one has a date of that moment. I tracked them for 10 months um, and ended up with a mural. Each row is a month of that process of binging. Um, so that's a little bit of my older work. Uh, I'm going to now show you more newer work that I'm still developing. This is called Finally We Are No One. I've uh, been working on it for about three years now. And, and now I'm thinking of, this is stemming up from that first project I showed you, The Losses, The Heartbreaks, with The Hungers. And now I'm thinking about, I'm still thinking about that with relationships with myself, right? But because I started becoming another, I'm also thinking about queerness and queer communities. And I was very interested in the idea of queer utopia. I was reading a lot of Jose Esteban Munoz and uh, what's his name? Um, Ernst Bloch and also Anne Kwektovich, which I've already mentioned. And my idea of a queer utopia has to do with, uh, I'm thinking about self-care a lot, right? Um, if you don't know, sometimes, especially uh, cisgender gay men can be tough on each other. And so I was very interested in talking about how we can take care of, of ourselves. So that's, that's my idea of utopia. Like how can we, we've done so much in the queer communities for recognition and um, rights and all of that, but there's still so much to do. So how can then we move forward and think about um, taking care of each other and becoming stronger as a community um, and all of that. And honestly, to this point, I'm still left with so many questions how does care manifest within queer community, queer male communities? How can we nurture ecologies of care and intimacy within the communities? How can we love ourselves and enjoy some hard earned polyamorous self-love? Um, and I'm also looking at cruising um, as a way of communing and, and existing oncology with possibilities for self-care and self-compassion. Um, I think we should all be taking care of each other and not bring it, each other down. Um, and in the, the project, um, obviously there's some issues, right? So there's like poison ivy hiding in the shadows. Um, it all looks all beautiful, but then you hit that poison ivy. Um, and um, in complicated ways in, in which we relate to each other's. Um, and also that idea of how can we push ourselves from being playing pre-existing roles and roles that are being imposed on us into different ways of relating to each other. Um, so it's all, all, all my work that I've shown is all in film. So it's a lot of work to create these scenarios. Um, 
it's almost exercising because it's it's all film. It's also medium format. So the film doesn't advance by itself. So I'm constantly running back and forth between the setting and the camera to create all of these illusions. And then I'm also using nature, thinking about the utopian idea of being in nature. And this is one of the funny photos of being trapped within all of these jock straps because we're always thinking about sex and bodies in queer communities, queer male communities. Um, I got caught photographing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also power dynamics are still happening. So there's a lot of follow up. It's sort of like the second chapter of that first body of work that I showed that was more intimate. Now it's a little bit more public um, and also in color. Um, this is all myself. I hope the effect is um, working. Grief, bodies, what we praise and love. Um, and hopefully we arrive at love between each other, not just a romantic or sexual or attraction, but something more deeper. Uh, so still a work in progress. Uh, I feel like I still have more to photograph, but I have a lot of material. Um, and then I was going fast. I thought I was going to run out of time, but I'm now going to end my talk with another performance. But I want to talk about a body of work that's called The Body is Expecting slash Experiencing some discomfort and this work is uh, an immersive installation that features aid related uh video performances this is an installation in august 2021 at publica which is a large gallery space in san juan puerto rico and you can see that video that i showed at the beginning at the end so it's really like this phantasmagoria of all of this uncomfortableness with your own body and the different things that are shameful, um, et cetera. So I really envision an immersive space in which you're walking from one place to the other and you're bombarded by the visual, but also the audio. Uh, the audio here is not that good, but hopefully you welcome come to my website and watch some of my performances. Um, so I'm gonna close my talk with another video performance. Uh, it's called Worth. Uh, yeah, and I'll let you watch it.
Thank you. Uh, are we doing a Q and A? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, I'm really fascinated by your, your work with shame and just kind of imagining all the different layers because like you're here talking about it and you're showing it. So I was wondering if you could talk about how your relationship with shame has changed over the years of your project from directly working alone with stuff to sharing it to it being online with so many you know, well, I mean, I think art is very powerful as catharsis, right? It's it's the 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 way that you then learn to communicate these issues through art. Art help you. Um, and honestly, ten years ago, me giving this talk to you and showing all this work, it would have never happened. It just makes me uh, help has helped me be more comfortable in myself and just being able to express all of this. And and that's what I'm looking for. I'm I'm like. Sometimes with shame specifically, we're so shamed with talking about it, right? So just being able to externalize it and, and put it into art and having people view it hopefully creates conversations in which we can then openly talk about all of these issues. Because uh, shame is very common on everybody, but we just don't know how to process it. And I'm still learning how to talk about shame. It's, it's, it's not easy. And there's so many layer, layers to it. I use the language of the photo, like the setting, the lighting, black and white versus color. And then I just, um, like in some, like the one on the left is really just cutting the chest and the abs and putting them on myself. But then the one in the center is so much more about the entirety of that scene. So there was a little bit of, of multiple decisions. Like here was just cutting off the, the arm and then I'm creating the scene. Um, but then the lumberjack, that was the scene. And so I just photographed myself in a way to fit that scene. And it wasn't complicated. There's a beach scene. There's one where there's the top of the torso is completely black, dark. So it's like a lot of, it was technically for as a photographer, it was a lot of fun. You mentioned that you worked with film. So all those combination of collages are analog. They're, digital. So the, the, the initial image is analog, but then I scan it and then I splice together. Uh, the initial idea was to actually do double exposures in the same frame. But I didn't. But then it was going to result in the body being transparent, and I didn't want that. I wanted the body to be solid, right? Not just like a ghost existing in there. So, so I made a decision to then, for sure. But I there's something about, especially that first project. Um, there's something about the film that and the grain and the way that film records light that makes it feel more realistic. I didn't... I, also, pieces of film that have not been exposed to light can be later exposed to light and vice versa. Right. And with, with a computer, you have one density for, for all values. Right. But then it was going to... I feel like the artifice was going to be more obvious. So the artifice, like the, the artificiality was going to be a little bit more obvious because then it was going to be so clean that um, it just didn't, it wouldn't feel with soul, if, if you want to use that word. Because <laughs> I've seen other projects in which people are multiplying themselves, but then you kind of like immediately see it, right? It's like, it's very obvious. So, so how did you do that one where you, you're, you're 
torso is grabbed by hands? Um, a lot of work, a lot of shots. Um, honestly, it's easier than you think it is. Um, that one? Yeah, that one. It's, it's, it's four shots in which I'm like making sure that the arm is outside of the frame so that it feels like, like it's coming into the frame. Right, and that's a fifth, the fifth arm, because that, because then I photograph myself first with with just like this, and then I start doing the all the different iterations of it. And do you show two vehicles there just so that the viewer knows about that? Can you say that again, sorry? So you have two belly buttons. I did that on purpose, yeah. <laughs> so that's two photos of the pulling of the belly. Yeah. Uh, spliced in a way in which it left like that. There's like the little bit of surrealism. I mean, that's not the little bit, but the more obvious. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for inviting me here, for connecting me. And I think, if you back off that, I think, I mean, for me, so much of your work is about the process of making the work and the handwork. So to me, it makes complete sense, but you're slowly down the process. And I have to say, you know, I, all of the work I have questions about, but the the, lead, the latest chemigrams, which is that, also the, the the graph of the cake with your trigger food is just, it just really hits me. It's such a beautiful, important piece. Um, so I don't know what the question is other than even when you're out in the woods and you're making these images, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. How do you reckon with that emotional space? It's part of it. I think it's part of what the first question was about. Like, how do you deal with shame? How do you then go through this process of performing shame, right? And embodying all of that. So, so it's really a lot of um, headspace. And I'll confess that with the first body of work that I showed, there was a lot of wine involved. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's part of the process of feeling comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. and embodying and performing all of these negative emotions. And in your process, in your space, how much tinkering goes into it? How much play, how, many, how much experimentation are you doing with the fatty and the chemigrams and the lumen prints? Is that, do you enjoy that or you just think about it and you execute it? Because you're really prolific. You work quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Not enough time. Um, you need, need more time and the winning lottery ticket. <laughs> Um, I wish I had a practice in which I tinkered a lot, but I just don't have the resources, the time, the money. And just until now, just in the past five months, I got a studio. So I've been doing this all at home. So I don't have the, the space to, to do it. So there's so much of it that's just marinating in my head. And luckily like this chemigrams came through from that, um, residency at Salzenstall that I had a whole month with a dark room in my apartment. I was like, this is it. This is how I'm able to really work on this job. And there was tinkering at the beginning. I wasn't sure what I was doing. And actually I'm showing you these camera cams and I'm still not sure what I'm doing with them. I still want to play with more of the idea of murals and I have a feeling they might end up becoming uh, a piece of mourning, right? For, survivors of bullying, um, uh, not a monument, but a, how do you call it? A memorial, a memorial. Just the technical achievement of some of these is so It's so interesting to combine that level of craft with a really emotionally charged mm -hmm. subject. Um, is something about combining that control and that, that meticulousness with um, kind of a rawness. Hmm. Uh, that, that, that just, that I think it's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I, I... I love the technicality in that in, that traditional photography involves, and 
I can never see myself like one of those artists that discovers one thing and then they just end up repeating it for their entire careers. I, I, I love their experimentation. I love changing the visual language uh, for each project uh, because there's so much fun in there. Um, and also, I guess this is something that gets drilled in your head when you do grad school. It's like, everything has to be for a reason, right? So, so then thinking about color versus black and white versus film versus digital versus chemigrams versus cyanotypes, then that's something that goes a lot in my head. It's fun. I was doing it in school. I was like, fuck this professors. <laughs> Can you uh, explain again how you did that? Sure. So I literally covered my hand in Crisco butter, right. and then I slapped the photo paper twice. In it's like Menray, right? Menray used to do it. So he, well, that's slightly different. Those are photograms. So in here, I'm grabbing the paper that now has the Crisco, and if I develop the paper without anything, it's going to be black. But because there's a lard uh, blocking the chemistry, um, there's not not everything's gonna be developed into black. But then I play with it. I, I use spray bottles with fixer and developer. I move the paper from fixer to developer back and forth many times to create those textures that are happening in the background that's like watery. Okay. And so it's really stressing the emulsion. This is black and white paper. But because of the stress of going between developer and fixer back and forth multiple times, it creates these beautiful hues that are very distinctive of chemigrams. So there's there's definitely a hand in play. I'm not developing just as is. I am have I guess that's some of the tinkering that Leslie was asking about was knowing, understanding when to switch it back and forth and when to use the spray bottle. It's sort of like this one, the fist on top was sprayed with fixer, so that's why it's white. But you didn't put any color in it. No. It's just uh, using it from the developer, from the fixer, from the stop bath. Yeah, no stop bath. No stop bath? No. The, okay. And then that stressing of back and forth creates these, these hues and of these color. Colors, yeah. This is another paper? No, it's black and white. So can you say that again, the last part? Right, and photogram. Now the pop, the photo, the paper has already been exposed. So any old paper, photo paper that you don't want, you can give it to me, and then I'll turn it into a chemigram because the paper is damaged. It's just going to be black if I develop it. So what I'm doing is actually controlling the levels of blackness. Uh, with all of these resists and the fixer, et cetera. So what you're saying, the paper is exposed and then you use it? Mm -hmm. I, I was using old paper that was donated to a school that I work with that I knew was fogged. And so I'm like, okay, so I'm just going to use them. Each, each, each one is 16 by 20. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very large paper. You enhance the color, but that's the color on the paper. That's how it came out. And you, and you use just light, or is it all in the dark? No, it's all, all outside. I did all the smearing out in broad light, daylight, and then I brought it into the dark room. So it's just damaged paper that would have been black. Do you need the dark paper? I need the chemistry. I'm saying that can happen in the light, though. That can happen in the light, yeah. Say that again? Right, there's no way of reproducing these. It's it's a one fa one time thing. Do you have to wash it with soap so it doesn't like dissolve? Yeah. 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 yeah, I use hot water and soap to get the oils and fat fat off, out. Thank you. <laughs> so the each each one of these tiles is sixteen by twenty, but the tire mural. It's 63 by 170. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here.